Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me on another episode of 24 News with Kushe. I am your host, Kushe Kwete Charles Maseko. Today, we have got um, the VF Plus Youth President and Member of Parliament, Tammy Briet. How are you, Tammy? Good, thanks to yourself, Kushe. I'm fine, thanks. And how has lockdown been for you? Lockdown has been interesting for me. It has been... Um, We've been very busy with work. We've been very busy with queries um, to find a new way how to do things to actually, you know, um, still do door to dooring and, and actually get your voters is, is cha- you know, is changing it up. And I have to say um, it's, it's been sad for me as well to see the amount of youth losing, losing hope, the amount of youth losing jobs. Um, so, so it really is as if we're in a, in a twilight zone. Tammy, um, let me just, uh, let's just actually get started with the interview. Um, Tammy, where did your love for politics start? Um, And and when did you start being politically active? Were you politically active before you even went to varsity? I I discovered I have an interest for politics when I was at high school. I um, was very fortunate enough to be chosen to be an exchange student in Germany. And I had this very staunch history teacher who, who taught us all about history. And I had a subject called politics. And I was, I was a typical rebel. And I said, you know, well, why do I have to learn about politics in Europe? I mean, I'm, I'm from Africa. I'm from South Africa. So why should I know that? And um, Herr Koch said, you know, you've got to learn that because at the end of the day, international politics affects you in your country in some way or another. And that's where I first discovered and, and where I realized what change, uh, you know, what a politician can do, you know, if you really fight for the good, how you can actually change people's lives for the better. And as a first year at university, I um, was at UOFs. I became actively involved. We had a political campus. Um, since then, the dynamic has changed a bit. Um, politics is not so freely participated at university anymore. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. I believe that is, that is one thing that is good. And that is one thing that needs to happen because you get to interact. You get to actually lead, discover what politics does um, in your day-to-day living. You see how in a, in a small microcosm, I almost want to say, um, you get to practice politics. You get to, you know, you get to interact. You get to hone your, your abilities and, and really see whether, you know, you agree with policies or not. Um, and I have to say, to this day, I have colleagues. Um, and we move up in ranks. We started out on the SRC. I believe you remember too. Um, yes, we I started do. Out in the, <laughs> we started out in the SRC. Um, we moved up, became councillors or, or worked at municipalities or were liaison officers for our parties and became legislature members and became members of parliament. And so, so that, in short, where, where, where my love started and, and how I moved the ranks. But yes. I've been actively participating since I was 18. And yes, I don't think I'll, I'll ever change. I love being able to help people. And I love seeing the difference that I can do, um, you know, in communities and specifically for the youth. Um, not many people know this, but you used to go to University of the Free State and you are a member, well, you are a student, you're a student member of parliament. You were part of the student parliament, excuse me, and you were a speaker on the, at the student parliament. Um, could you share any difficulties that you had when it came to um, chairing the meetings and also being neutral when it comes to being a speaker? Yes, you know, that, is, that I think is, is one of the difficulties that you have to learn. Um, as you have your, your preconceived ideas, you have your party loyalties, and to actually sit on that chair and I have to say, um, myself and a colleague of mine from, from Sasco had had this conversation where, where we spoke. And he said, that's going to be very important. And he would watch us. Um, and he knows that I, I can do that. And I have to say, in terms of you get so furious for people, you, you're sitting there and you're debating arguments. And on the one side, you have, and I'm sure you're experiencing it as well, um, we had we had our, our university management that would not necessarily always take us seriously. 
So you had to continually balance um, fighting to being taken seriously um, and, and to still be a student, but also to have that middle ground to equally chase out your own party's members and to rule against them and, and to chase and, and rule out against the others. And I have to say, um, some days it was easier than other days. Um, yeah. some, days you, <laughs> some days my own party members made it easy for me to chase them out. I, um, I actually serve with a colleague um, in, in Parliament now that I used to chase out quite often from my own party. Um, <laughs> and I have to say nothing much has changed to this day. He is still shouting and he's still giraffing and he's still do <laughs> doing everything. But I have to say that was specifically... Um, Growing up um, in, in an Afrikaans community with, with to a large extent, um, my own language community and my own cultural community and, and being exposed to so many different people, so many languages, so many different cultures. Um, and then on top of that, so many different policies and politics and, and parties in between. And it really teaches you to grow up very fast and it teaches you to listen. Um, you used to sit on the Free State Legislature in 2017. Um, currently, you are a member of the National Assembly. So, um, what lessons would you share with the Free State Legislature, with your experience in the National Assembly when it comes to running meetings and the way the provincial government is run there? The one thing is, I think that our provincial legislature needs to, needs to learn its rules better. Um, during my time there, I, I always in the National Assembly, I say I miss to a large extent, I miss the Free State Legislature in terms that we were 30 members and now we are 400 members. Um, you, get to, you get to interact with your MECs a lot closer, a lot more frequently than you do with your ministers. Um, but the one thing I have seen in the way we handle meetings, the way we handle sittings of parliament, is, is really in terms of, of, of rules and knowing what you can and cannot do, knowing what you can and cannot say, and, and actually pushing those boundaries. Um, and also, um, at the, in the greater sense of that, um, if you know your rules, you provide a proper democracy. You, you, you use your, your democracy a lot better. Um, public participation is a lot better when you know those rules and you can actually get your communities, get the whole of South Africa, because that's what, at the end of the day, makes South African politics and what makes our democracy so awesome is because it is largely based on public participation. And um, so you have a say, every person, every single person has a say. And I think to a large extent, we aren't using that to its full potential in the Free State Legislature. Um, Tammy and yourself, um, Sam, sorry, Tammy, yourself and uh, Helois, Heloise Dinner, excuse me, yes. um, were the first members of, uh, for VF Plus in the National Assembly, first women to ever represent the VF Plus in the National Assembly. Um, what positives do you think your party drew from actually putting women in the National Assembly? Since uh, What positives has, has your party drew since the deployment of yourself and Heloise in the National Assembly when it comes to women empowerment? I think um, maybe firstly, let's start there. Um, we're the first women in the National Assembly. We could, and uh, when I was in the legislature as well, I used to say, unfortunately, I cannot say I was the first woman in the legislature because when the party started in 1994, um, it was established six weeks before the 27 April um, national elections, first democratic elections. And we actually had 50% of our women representatives in legislature were women. Um, so, but let me, let me to continue, um, we do not have quotas. We say that women should be elected rightfully. Um, and, and therefore you see that we do not have that 50, 50 representation and, um, Heloise and I got there on merit. Um, I was speaker of student parliament when she was president of the student representative council. So I like to think that we built up our, our, you know, um, we, we built up ourselves up until we got there. But what I've seen since we've been there is I think it's, great, it's brought more balance 
to an extent. And I think it's given young women, especially more hope, especially within our party. Um, to this day, we see in, in all political parties, some have have merit systems, some have quota systems. But what we really um, see is women are still largely not entering the political sphere because for so long, I mean, for hundreds and hundreds of years, it's been a male-based thing. It take South Africa, the first time women, um, and that's not even all women got to vote, was in 1933. Um, we were, were one of the later, you know, one of, one of the later countries to do that. And to this day, we see that tendency. Women do not actually participate. And I think that's what we've done. That would be, that's what we've seen. Um, and uh, I really do think we bring some, some um, coolness to the hot-headedness that men can have when, when they are in their collective. And I would like to see more of it. I would like to see um, more young females um, actually become counselors. We, in the free state, I have to say, we are almost 50-50, um, men and women. And I have to say, looking at COVID-19 specifically, looking at the countries that have women as leaders, um, if you think of Denmark, you think of um, New Zealand, um, and you see the way, way women have handled themselves within, within politics and within those spheres. You look at service delivery. I really think uh, the fact that women have compassion and the fact that women are the natural nurturers, I think we need to see more of that because I think that would completely change our politics. And I think that would change the way in, in which countries actually um, reach their citizens and actually holistically look at a country and its legislation. Um, could you share any difficulties that you had when it came to transitioning from being an MPL member of the legislature to becoming a member of the National Assembly as obviously there's more work and there's more duties that you have? Yeah, I have to say um, the first thing was the commuting um, to I stay in Bloemfontein so we don't have very many flights to get to and from, from Cape Town. So, so, and to be away from your, your support network, your, your friends, your family to a large extent and being away. And um, as I mentioned, we were 30 in the legislature, we are 400 in the National Assembly, and it is all a bunch of very smart people. Um, you kind of build your nation, but my, my aunt usually says you're a big fish in a small pond. When you, get, when you get to being an MPL and everybody knows it. And all of a sudden, you're this tiny little fish who still needs to make your mark in this vast, vast ocean. And I do have to say that was one of the challenges. Um, in the legislature, I served on all the portfolio committees. We had five cluster portfolio committees. And now I had to focus on one portfolio committee. Um, so that was a bit of a cha change. Um, and you sit there with people who have have been in parliament for a term or two or three terms. Um, my chairperson is Nkosi Mandela. So you sit there with a bunch of legacies, a, a bunch of people you, you grew up knowing and seeing on TV, and all of a sudden you have to hold your own. And I think that is some of the biggest challenges. Us as, as politicians are not usually easily intimidated, but, but as a young member in my portfolio committee, I am the youngest by a number of years. Um, in my party, I am the youngest M uh, MP. Um, and that brings with it a lot of challenges and and scariness to actually you know to actually hold your own um but i i think i've i've gotten used to it there are still some days where that that really feels as if you're climbing an uphill battle um and and also the difficulties i was used to solving a problem like this i could you know pick up the telephone and i could phone an hd or you can phone an mec and you can say listen you help me do this and to a large extent you you don't have that um, you have to follow the, the protocols and the channels and that that's that's something to get used to and and sometimes you know because south africa is so large your problem your individual problem um sometimes doesn't get 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 resolved as easy as you expected it and and that is is one of the biggest challenges and um, how have you used your position as the national youth leader of the VF Plus to promote and educate youth about politics? I think to a large extent, we've got certain initiatives, um, specifically um, at schools. 
um, to actually start talking with those matrix, those grade twelves, um, to have open days at universities, um, to to continually participate and to engage, to engage with youth um, on different forums, to go to different places, to not necessarily um, to to walk with your I've got a Freedom Front Plus hoodie on today, um, to actually be proud of of your party and I have to say um, I, I proudly wear my Freedom Front Plus regalia and to actually experience to be at a Opikopi or a festival and having young people actually talk to you and say but what's that what's that about I really have to say I think that has has broadened and that's the one positive that COVID-19 has also brought is the way that we can webinar the way that we can you know zoom and and all of the rest different things to actually get to the people um uh, I think that that's been one of the one of the critical things that we have done and and that I that I have managed and to get people talking um as as you know you know I I said I would like to change the stigma I would like to show South Africa that the Freedom Front Plus is a progressive party we we see things as 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 is we we want to build South Africa want to make South Africa better and we don't need to be these staunch you know stereotypes that that people see us as and and i think i've i've broken that barrier i was democratically elected and i mean I've, I've, i'm the first woman youth leader that our party has had um i have blonde hair and i listen to to very alternative south african music and i have tattoos and i think to to a large extent by being me and being vocal and, and having a a support system within my youth structures that go out and that aren't scared to, to push the boundaries, I think have, has really helped and has, has really seen the way that we've, um, throughout the banks of, of different South Africans, actually broadened their minds to what we are and, and that the youth of the Freedom Front Plus is the future. Um, VF Plus has managed to do this slightly better than the rest of Parliament. As you would know, um, the, par the parliamentary average age is about 54, 55. Um, the VF Plus is just slightly under 50. Um, what were the difficulties the VF Plus had when it came to electing members to go to Parliament when your party won, or when your party won actually six extra seats in uh, last year's national elections? Mm -hmm. What were the difficulties when it came to also having to put youth and also putting mm -hmm. a few experienced male ladies and gentlemen in the Parliament? I think... That I have to say is, is once again, I mentioned earlier that we work solidly on a merit system, that we do not have, have a quota system in terms of women and men, in terms of age. And I have to say our party has, as I've said, I've been involved with the party since I was 18 years old. And we have a, a lot of our older leadership. Um, our, our leader, Dr. Grunewald, our chief whip, Dr. Dr. Mulder, have really, if you historically go and look, they were the young rebels who got, you know, um, who left their party and who started the Freedom Front Plus when they were, you know, these these 30 pluses because they saw a new vision. And I think that's one critical thing that they have managed to do for us is they have taken us as these, you know, bright eyed, you know, 18 year olds. They've really taken us and matured us and, and taught us. And they've, they've given us at a very young age, they've given us responsibilities within the party to actually partake, to, to take a stance, um, to lead by example. And, and during our democratic pr process where we had to make speeches, we had to write it to an exam about the party and about politics within South Africa and um, to actually see what we've been involved in within the party. I think we've been very fortunate that, that I can say that the, the 10 members of, of the National Assembly um, and our two additional NCOP members were really there democratically elected and um, within the structures and, and, and within the way we elect members, we've, without actually taking preference to who is young and who is experienced, we've managed to get that balance and I think that's very good. I, I, I really think that is, is very good. If you look at my colleagues um, who have who, who serve with me. You've mentioned Heloise, who was, was SRC president and who's also been involved. If you look at my colleague, um, Voter Vessels, who is our election head from a very early onset, 
um, he was taught by our previous election managers how to do things and how to actually give him more responsibilities. Um, Michal Grunewald, he was, you know, he became provincial leader of the Northwest when he was 36 years old. So I think we really have a, um, shall we call it a culture within the party that, that we have a, have a, um, a future oh, yeah. vision and that, that the youth really get empowered. Um, my next question to you is, um, why do you think it's important that the youth that are still in school should understand the importance of politics and the significance in voting or when it comes to voting? As we can see that there's been a large number of youth that didn't go out to vote in last year's national elections. I think the most important thing that we need to get, uh, we need to, to teach our, our, our learners at this stage is politics really affects your daily lives. You mentioned now we have a, we, we didn't see a large number turnout. And I think our youth have, have really become discouraged. Our, our youth have, have really that they we've seen VB, the VBS scandal we've seen in the free state we've seen Freda dairy scandal I mean we've seen the Guptas we've we've seen so many the youth have been failed so many times I we had our youth day debate in parliament um and and the the rhetoric and and what I said at a stage was I think to a large extent, the youth of 2020 are also experiencing the frustration that the youth of 76 felt. Um, it's, a, it's a new party that, that's in government, but to a large extent, our struggles are still the same. We are still unequal. Our, our you know, learners are not being, you know, being taught in their mother tongue. Um, you are forced to go to school in, in English. Um, and I really do think that, that that's what young people need to start understanding is the more they vote, the more they go out, the more they have an opportunity to, to change. At the end of the day, um, Africa has the, Africa as continent has this. what do you call it, the youngest ratio of, of citizens. I think our average age is, is 23 or 24 years old, yet our leaders are just in the world and our world leaders average, or our, our leaders within Africa average um, 70 plus years of age. And that is purely because the youth are not standing up. The youth are not participating in the system. The youth are not putting up their hands and saying, listen here, here I am, pick me. I want to be in government. This is what is important to me. And I think that is really what we need to get our, our, our learners from a young age to understand is the tax you pay on your milk and bread. Um, what side of the road you drive in is all having to do with politics. And if you don't like it, you can change it. We need to learn from all of the others, um, all of the other countries. If you look at the Arab Spring, you look at so many other um, world shifts, world changes has become because the youth have come, have, you know, stood up and said enough is enough. Um, I don't think we need to do it, um, you know, with riots and with breaking and as we've seen in, in the rest of the world with, with all lives and black lives matter. Um, I think we can do it peacefully. And I think that is what politics and that is what our electoral, electoral system actually brings to the table. And I know I asked you um, about the importance of understanding when, of, of politics when it comes to the youth. My other question that I have for you is, um, how should we as a country start making the youth that are still in school have an interest, not just understanding, but at least have an interest in politics, so that we start having more political leaders that are young coming through the ranks, as we've seen with VF+, EFF, Democratic Alliance, and a bit in the ANC? I think our biggest problem is, and I, I mentioned earlier at school when, when I was an exchange student, we had, we had a subject called political studies and social studies. And I think that's the first thing. I think that is why a lot of our youth um, are not entering the political sphere, are not voting because we don't understand it. We have a very difficult system and we are so inundated by what American politics is and what British politics is. And, you know, you, you see all of these things and you see Trump's face or Obama's face and you think that's how South African politics works. And you think that if you don't, 
you, you know, you don't vote for the guy who becomes president, that your vote is lost. And I think that is the one thing. So firstly, I would suggest that we we actually build into our syllabus, into our curriculum. Um, we build a subject as politics or, yeah, dem democracy 101. I don't know what you call it, but you really start with learning about our our system and you learn about our constitution and um, you learn about our our um, human rights and you physically get to know that because uh, a youth that has knowledge a youth that knows what is happening i think is an empowered youth and can make decisions um built on built on that because the minute you understand the way your our constitution is written the way you understand how much power we as people actually have and um, how much power we have to to elect the party of the day and um, to make those changes to with public participation actually go out and say you know what you i know you want to write this bill but i don't agree i think this and this and this needs to change i think that's that's this way we need to start and then we need to build on that i think us as youth leaders within political parties have an extremely important role and i to a large extent think that um that political parties might be failing our youth in terms of that that we might not be doing it enough to actually go out and teach our youth why they need to become involved why they need to why they need to participate in something as wonderful as our democracy and i think that's what we need to do i think us as as young members in our different political parties need to actually stand up and we need to keep the you know the the current legislatures responsible but we also need to do more to encourage future legislatures to do the same um you know you spoke about education and educating uh, the youth about human rights and uh, all sorts i'd like i'd like to just um ask that um when you look at the south african education system when it comes to your social science because um to some great respect politics is related to a bit of social science when you talk about your history because that's where you learn that oh this is how certain systems were how um, certain political leaders did this so um my question to you is do you believe the south african education system needs to have a whole relook at what students are learning and perhaps look at including more south african history into our education as currently um i read that we're actually learning more foreign than we're learning local yes i agree with you 100 percent um when my brother was at school he learned about the vikings and you know urban myths that the vikings had and he did very little little south african uh, you know um, history and i really think that is one thing and and the one thing i can specifically say about our our call of the social sciences as you mentioned is that history depends on who writes it and and unfortunately i see a lot and and not to to bash or bad mouth but but i think our that is what is also fundamentally wrong is is the way our history is being taught um our youth are are learning to hate each other our youth are learning to see the color of your skin um our youth are learning that because you speak a certain language you are wrong or you are are you know hysterically or or uh, you know historically racist or or whatever the case may be and i think we need to have a balanced approach we need to learn of the bad of south africa because we need to learn not to repeat it but we also need to learn about the good of south africa if you think of the windscreen wiper a south african actually you know discovered the windscreen wiper if you look at a creepy crawly for a swimming pool um if you look at the first heart transplant so there's a lot of things that south africa has done good and and i think we need to focus on that i 100% agree that yes you need to learn about about world history but i do think we are not learning enough we are not focusing enough about South Africa's history is colorful and it is interesting and it is intricate and i think that south africa if we learn about all all of the history equally and we learn about the difficulties that we all face i think it will actually empower our youth to really be um i'm maybe an optimist but i would really like to see the rainbow nation be a proper rainbow nation see the rainbow nation that um that 
the 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 struggle brought you know brought on i would like to see us to you know to celebrate our, our diversity um the preamble of our constitution says unity and diversity and i think what is wrong with the current schooling system is we are making ourselves all shades of gray we are we are striving for mediocrity and not for excellence and i think that is the greatest thing we need to change is we we need to strive for excellence and we are not currently doing that and not seeing that within our schooling system you know when you say that was striving for mediocrity um i tend to believe that that comes with having a lack of patriotism in our country amongst people in our country um we have seen with the recent burnings of school and um burning of schools in KZN and wherever and stealings of food parcels and all sorts um how do you think we as a country should also be addressing the issue of patriotism at a young age to make sure that we start building up a nation of youth that love their country and have great respect for each other and like you said unity and diversity have unity and diversity yeah. I think that is one of the big problems in South Africa at this stage. We live from sporting event to sporting event. We live for the 2010 Soccer World Cup and we are patriotic and we have those little flags over our mirrors. And then we live for the next Rugby World Cup or the Netball World Cup or when a, a Miss South Africa becomes Miss Universe and we can be proud of her. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I was just as patriotic when when zozi was crying i was like yeah um but i do think that that is not proper nation building nation building that is just living from one event to the next and i think with um with our our extremely difficult and intricate past and actually um understanding that and and you know understanding that i think that is that is the one thing that will firstly help to create a south africa where we understand that everybody has seen suffering but as south africans we are resilient i think that's maybe the one thing that we need to start with um and i have to say i do agree with you i think the problem is and and why we are striving for mediocrity is because we don't have that patriotism we have a he said she she said sorry type of um of political system at this as this stage we are seeing a lot of scapegoating within our politics and i think once we see um once we see a government that is really serious about south africa as a whole um and puts legislation there to actually promote youth empowerment um that bases bases help on our social economic circumstances um and not you know not gave your ns fast bursaries to those students who are politically connected but those who really have the potential who come from a kaile chanagugule to or even a a grootfontein who are those who really have the potential who have the potential to grow and um i think that really um that is a start and that is where we can actually start by creating a country full of patriots Now I like the fact that you spoke about Nesfas because that was going to be one of my next question. That was actually going to be my next question. Um I wanted to ask with you being the national youth leader of the VF Plus. Um what suggestions do you have for the governing party to deal with the missing middle that is too rich for Nesfas but yet too poor to afford varsity. And we know that every student that is able to make it to varsity is an asset to this country and we need to use that. Exactly. No, what I I would suggest to to the government that they look at alternatives that they start actually practicing what they what they preach. We have um exceptional TVET colleges. Um you know, um other universities of technology that say like CUT um in Bloemfontein, you know, which is which is additional to our universities. And I think our government really needs to look at that. needs to look at a way that students um lack the missing middle that do not necessarily um get to go to university but actually have those opportunities to in terms of of short course courses and 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 certificates 
actually get get to do something. Um, talking about NISFAS as well in the missing middle, I would really like to see um, to see a relook of how we actually do our bursaries um, with within our government. That you really, as I say, that you do not reach the political politically connected. That you physically go and sit and look at those children and and. Even so, have bursaries that you pay back at the end of the day. Um, in the free set a few years back, we saw that we had bursaries where students were given bursaries, but the condition was that you pay it back um, in terms of you go and work it back. So your doctors that receive bursaries from your Department of Health actually works it back and goes to your rural communities for five years or whatever the contract was. And we actually saw that that never realized. You had your doctors, you had your engineers, you had those guys willing to make a commitment and the government and, and the departments failed to actually employ them. And I think that is what the government needs to focus on, to actually not just give out bursaries, but to have a type of, of loan subsidy. Um, and also the government needs to look at legislation for companies mm -hmm. to then subsidize because we've also got to be realistic. We do not necessarily have the fiscus um, in South Africa to look at, um, to, to sponsor all of the children through government bursaries. So we need to look at legislation that either in terms of rebates for, for businesses or, or you, know, you know, something to that extent, actually promote it and encourage businesses to, to give scholarships and to have, you know, to, to actually address that missing middle and to ensure that children, um, based on, on absolutely their, you know, their talents, can go to university, can go to TVET colleges, can go to colleges and actually train further to assist South Africa and to grow South Africa. Um, you know, I see this as a, uh, there's a very important question right here. I think mm -hmm. I'll actually ask you, it's from one of the viewers, and um, it says, please share exactly what your party stands for. And mm -hmm. I think that our, the reason I'm asking you this question is because um, I think it's important that we, as the people of South Africa, actually start Thank knowing you. about who are we voting for and uh, why are we voting for this particular group person or certain party so if i could ask um could you please tell what ideologies does your party believe in just briefly please okay well let's start our party was created um in 1994 the first of march 1994 plus minus six weeks before and um, before the first democratic election and it was started as a party for minority groups um, at that stage, specifically Afrikaner speaking, speaking people who wanted to participate um, with, within our democratic society, who believed in equal opportunities for all, who believed in Christian values and who would like to see a South Africa grow. What the party has evolved, has evolved through and what the party actually stands for is equal opportunities for all. We do believe that we need to do away with um, legislation that is actually hampering the economy. Um, for example, uh, black economic empowerment and affirmative action, because at the end of the day, they are not assisting any except a few politically connected. We believe that um, you should be assisted in terms of your socioeconomic basis, that um, you should get funding in SFAS, for example, because you are lower middle class, not because of your skin color. We believe that um, we should have a free market system and um, so to a large extent, we are capitalists that believe um, in an economy must be free and that has limited involvement within the, that in the economy, sorry, has limited involvement from the government. But that we believe in a, in a government that sits there that doesn't, um, in Afrikaans, you say stand back on, um, that, that relies on, on social grants, but actually empowers its people and sits legislation there to create a, 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 a equal society uh, uh, active society where it is conducive for jobs and job creation. Um, and then we, we believe in the private sector should be allowed to um, freely operate within such an economy. So that is the, that is the, the short and the long of, of what the party stands for. Um, we are specifically a, a, um, at this stage a, a minority, um, a minority deep um, party, shall we say, um, where we really promote that because because your your um, your your minorities. I'm losing my words. Um, it's been a long week, but where your minorities are actually allowed to also participate within an economy. Um, as I said earlier, 
um, unity and diversity. And that is one thing that we believe in, that South Africa is made up of uh, many different cultures, many different languages, many different religions. And and at the end of the day, the being of the Freedom Front Plus believes that each one of us deserves our little place under the African sun. Um, we believe that that should be promoted um, within, within South Africa and that... Um, in such a society where there are equal opportunities, um, the most resilient and the people who who can participate in the economy at, at the, you know at the, the end of the day would actually participate and will benefit the whole of South Africa. Um, my next uh, question to you is: um, Our parliament is about forty five percent representation of women. What is the missing ingredient in the pot that will at least balance out this ratio? As we've seen, well, not really as we've seen, but with our African brothers like Rwanda, that's have got more than 60% representation of women. Yeah. I think South Africa, and if not wanting to go there, but, but having to go there, um, GBV, if we've seen the gender-based violence and femicide rate within, within South Africa, and we've seen, and, and I, to a large extent, think that is the problem. We are... Even though we are promoting women, we are paying lip service to women. We are not, we are not really empowering women to be equal. Um, we are not teaching women. We are not teaching young girl children to stand up. We are continually informing them of, you know, to an example, you shouldn't dress that way. It is because you dress that way that you are being raped. You, um, if a boy is rude to you, you know he likes you. Um, if a boy, if a boy pulls your hair, it's because he's he's just trying to touch you. And I think that is the problem with South Africa. We are continually um, discouraging our girls. We are currently telling them how they should be less of themselves when we are not telling them how to be more of themselves. Um, I have a colleague who usually said, "If we think women are equal, we are mistaken." because women have always been far superior. And I think that is what we need to start doing. And I think that is what us as women need to start doing. Women from different political parties, we need to stop bringing each other down. We need to stop belittling each other. And we really need to start standing up for one another. Um, we can't continue a fight of GBV and femicide if us as women continually blame the men for that if we as women are not standing up, if we as women are not taking that stance. And I think to see, as you said, um, I think Rwanda is one of the, um, in the world, they are the, they have the highest representation of, of women legislatures. Um, and we need to go look at that. We need to go look at how they have actually empowered their rural women, because to a large extent still we see that our women in the cities who have become you know, uh, used to the job market, they still, they partake, but we don't have that in our rural communities through the bank. And that's what we need to start doing. Um, but if we continue to break each other down, um, as we've seen, I don't think, I don't think we will ever be better. And uh, here's another question for you. Um, what are your views on capitalism, taking into account that there's more inequality than ever? Yeah. The fact of the matter is, why do we see inequality at this stage? And and we can go into the history. That is that is a, a long, difficult, in, you know, intricate discussion for another day. But if we had equal opportunities, if we gave the poorest of the poor those NSFAS bursaries, if we gave them the opportunities, if we really focused on starting out um, our schools, you see our schools in, in townships that sit with 50 children in a class and one teacher. You maybe have an assistant teacher. Um, I think if we really address those inequalities, we start through the bank with, and, and government needs to address that. Why are we not employing more, more, more teachers? Why aren't we building more schools? Why aren't we teaching our society? And, and that is a thing that we all have to study. But if you promote, if, if you want to see an equal society, um, if you want to see a free market society, you have to ensure that those that that are capable and that are willing, but they do not necessarily have the social economic stances, they need to be uplifted. And I believe if if you start with that approach, if you start with 
with equal opportunities. If you give a child who really has, who has nothing, who has, who is poor, but who has the ability, and you reach with that and you pay it forward, I think that is going to address our inequality within South Africa a lot better than we are currently doing. Because what we are currently doing um, with, and, and we're doing a very good job in terms of the 18,2 people that we are supporting by, with SASA. But the Department of Social Development has said in the mandate that we are there to develop and empower our communities and our and, and our, our people to actually fend for themselves. And I do not think we are doing that at this stage. And that is why we are not seeing that that bridging of this inequality that we are seeing is because we are not teaching people how to fish, we are giving them fishes. Um, you know, I want to ask this question, and um, as obviously I go to um, a multiracial school, and um, basically in, within my school, race doesn't exist, we're friends with everyone. I'd like to ask, um, since South Africa was still battling with killing certain stereotypes, um, how does the VF Plus plan on killing certain stereotypes by saying that it's just based for one group, but in, in, in terms of saying that the VF Plus is for everyone, how does the VF Plus, how will the VF, VF Plus appeal to everyone? How do you think the VF Plus appeals to everyone when it comes to societal issues? I think if you look at our policies and our clear cut policies, in terms of none of them are based on race. To say that whether you, if you agree with our policies, no matter your color, and I think that needs to be, that needs to be, um, the deerslaggevende factors, um, that needs to be the factor that you take into account, um, is if you, socioeconomic circumstances, um, equal opportunities for all. If you believe in a free market system um, and you believe that people are, even though I'm a Christian and that is what my party stands for, and um, that you are allowed to, to, without discrimination, without judgment, be able to practice your religion. And I think that is how, how the Freedom Front Plus is actually bridging that gap. I think that is why we've seen um, the, the increase in our number of members of parliament. I think that's why we've seen a number, um, the increase in, in our, our voter base is because at the end of the day, people are seeing that you are not putting a young person or a woman in a place because you need to have a young person or a woman in place. You're putting per people there on merit. And I think that is why people are voting for the Freedom Front Plus. And I think that is how we are appealing to the masses is by showing that and we have different people, uh, you know, we have a leader who is to a large extent very, you know, um, calls a spade a spade and he's, you know, he's, he's conservative and he's, you know, strict to that extent. And you have somebody like myself who has tattoos and blonde hair. Um, and who is is a, a younger, you know, who who is younger and, and and spirited in that extent. And I think that is at the, the that is the crux of 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 what we are um, and how how we are appealing to a larger market. Is we are not pretending to be something we are not, and and we believe that is how South Africa needs to go forward. Um, currently, I am sixteen years old, and my question to you is. What should make the youth of my age want to join VF Plus? And what programs do you have for the youth when it comes to teaching youth about politics? We are in the process of, of developing a, um, a, a youth school. We have um, yearly, we have a youth summit that we actually try and teach um, a bit of our history um, a bit, you know, and, and to actually implement that and to have a plan forward and how you can learn from the past to go forward. Um, so, so we have those annually and we are busy working on, on an actual, if you can call it that political school where you have a series of webinars. Um, I am working with, with Women's Day on the way. I'm working at a webinar, webinar to actually speak to women and to see what, what is the issues that we are currently, currently faced with. We as, as legislatures have a certain way in which we think the youth are supposed to be and which young women are supposed to be and we need to hold more of these forums um so so yes i think that is that is the one way that that we actually are encouraging people and what i would say why you need to join the freedom front class is because 
if you want to be the change you want if you want to see see change and you want to be part of that change i think you need to join the freedom front plus i think we have proven with these elections with these past elections that we are a party that are willing to go forward if you you follow us and see what we say in parliament um as i mentioned we we just had had um youth day debate um I really think follow us and and see what we see see what we say and if you really want to be a party who um in front of the cameras and behind the cameras you know um you can criticize where criticism is due but you can also appreciate the good that has been done and I think that is why that is why the youth need to participate in become part of the freedom front plus because we are really a modern party um that wants to see South Africa suffice that wants to see South Africa um i see here's one um one comment that says if you were to dream of a perfect south africa how would it look like and and i would like to see that and i would like to answer that question by i like i i see a rainbow i see a a political party a freedom front plus where we believe in the same things where we believe in equal opportunities where we believe in in a south africa where a uh, free market suffices where we can differ in our cultures and we can differ in our languages but at the end of the day we want to see south africa become a world power again we want to see south africa be competitive we want to see as uh, south africa we are already doing good in terms of agriculture i mean in terms of our wine and our wool exports um wool i think we're you know we're exporting um 90% of china's demand for wool is coming from south africa and i think if we see that um and i think that is why why young people need to become involved with the freedom front plus because we will actually um we want to see legislation set there and we want to keep the government responsible and we want to keep them on their toes to say but let's see that let's see a south africa where we we can really work to the betterment of south africa and actually celebrate our differences and not have that be a crucifix that we are currently hitting each other with and um what should make the youth vote to vf plus in next year's 2021 local elections if they want to see more young people participate if they want to have a voice if they want to be involved and i would not just like to see them vote for us i would like to see them stand as candidates because at the end of the day and continually we've seen that youth involvement and youth who stand up actually change and i think our municipalities have um you know great gaping holes that we need to improve on um we need infrastructure and we need a whole way of of doing local government to look at our our cities and our communities and at the end of the day by caring for your community it starts with local communities and we would like to see that um that is why that is why the youth need to vote for us because we want small municipalities we want towns that are are better developed and we would really like to see that change and that is why they should vote for us Um thank you Tammy for joining us on today's interview of 24 news with Gusle. Um thanks a lot for joining us. Um you really did give us some food for thought and how we should go forward as a country. I'd like to thank the viewers for joining and for the questions that they've sent through. I think it's really important as a country that we start looking at how we can change the political face of South Africa. Yes. Uh thanks a lot for joining us. Please keep safe and goodbye. Thank you so much Kuchle. Thank you for all your listeners as well. Thank you for having me. Um yes and stay strong. Um there is hope South Africa is in our hands. We need to grab it with both hands and I would like to chat with you again. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>